these are massive problems for the future. Every time I talked about the stock market, I had to plug a climate change and waking up that it would dominate investment portfolios of the future, which of course it will. My job description is underrated long-term problems. They're absolutely fascinating and not the least reason is why are they underrated? How do people ignore them? But it, it brings us back to uh, toxicity. We are making this planet uh, hostile to life in every form. There is every reason to think there are the insect population from the tropics to the poles has gone down by 50% and it's probably closer to 75. Every insect person that you can meet will tell you that that could have dire results. The top ones we spent hours badgering poor old E.O. Wilson, uh, recently deceased, uh, just before COVID on this topic. The great insect people believe that when insects go, and they seem to be going, they're dropping at over 1%, closer to 2% a year in, in biomass of insects, of wild insects. And um, when they go, it might cascade into um, a threat to uh, human survivability also. The trouble is they can't prove it. Why can't they prove it? Because it's an incredibly complicated system-wide problem, which is not financed. E.O. Wilson, the rest of the guys, could not get money to fund broad-based research of the type that is required to prove a cascade effect from broad loss of insects. Then soil erosion. We might be down to our last 30, 40 decent years of traditional farming as the soil gets eroded from important parts, breadbasket parts of the world. There are two pretty good problems to be going on with. Water shortages, horribly unappreciated. And what about the population base? The population, the fertility rate in South Korea is 0.8. So they're more than halving every generation of 35 years. They're more than halving their baby cohorts. Japan is 135. The US is 165. The UK about 1.7. And parts of uh, Europe, Hungary, Italy, very low, getting close to one. This is a crash. We have no idea how we'll be able to handle aging population and few workers. I think the world is in complete denial about uh, ocean level rise. And, and one day when Miami gets an incredible flood, it will wake up and, and do something down in Miami. This is a pay-as-you-go system that we have. We respond as I say, when we get whacked on the nerves. We're not anticipating in, in mitigation expenditures. We're spending nothing. We're just waiting to see what happens. And what happens is getting obviously very much worse very quickly in the last two years. The climate, I hope, is just having a run of bad luck from our point of view. I don't believe this could possibly be typical. The fact that we have severe droughts in China, India, Europe, and North America at the same time is completely without parallel in history. And you will notice that even though they are in severe droughts, they are simultaneously having here and there floods of a level that we have never seen before, washing away German towns. Not enough to break the, the drought, the Rhine is unpassable. We have floods in Pakistan, but not enough to break the drought in the Indian subcontinent, etc. floods in China floods in, in North America. We will be long gone as a species at 10 degrees centigrade. It is quite obvious at 1.1 that we are already having trouble. At two, we will be struggling and societies will fail here, there and everywhere. At three, in a sense, forget about it and we may have to deal with it, but it will be grievous. At 10 degrees, it takes real imagination to come up with a little number of GDP loss. No, they're complete jokes. You cannot find a serious climate scientist who would bet that society as we know it on a global basis will still be around at five degrees centigrade. I have met a lot of them and I asked them this question. Not one thinks we have any material chance of a stable society at five degrees centigrade. And the idea that you can bandy around 10 is reserved for Nobel Prize winners. My worry has always been and still is timing. We don't have a lot of time to spare. The damage we do is already pretty obvious and it's getting worse rapidly. There are many flashpoints that the serious climate scientists will tell you about. We could pass them any time where the temperature in, in the far north releases methane and CO2 from tundra 
and from offshore frozen methane, clathrates they call them. And that could spiral the temperature out of control. The jet stream could shift. The equivalent ocean currents could shift. There are several of these potential self-reinforcing uh, cycles that, uh, and, and of course the classic one is you melt the ice, the ice reflected the sun, and now the dark ocean absorbs it and the temperature goes up faster and more ice melts, etc. We are really playing with fire and we just don't know how long we've got, how high the temperature can go without triggering these points. You cannot find a serious climate scientist who would give you a guarantee that that will not happen. Some of them think it's very likely, some of them think it's unlikely, but all of them agree it can happen when you play with another degree or two centimeters. We have to redesign our way around lithium. We are just going to have to find another way uh, to make uh, lightweight batteries using something other than lithium. And uh, potassium and uh, sodium would be are very good candidates and we'll probably do it. And there are hundreds of times more sodium and potassium around than lithium. Commodities, unlike a lot of growth aspects, you're dealing with a store that is completely finite. So even if your growth rate decelerates, your store gets less and less. If you're growing at 10% in China, it gets less very rapidly. If you're growing at 2% in Europe, it still gets less. If your growth rate slows, the reserves do not mystically increase. That's the difference to almost all aspects of growth and resources. The interesting thing about green energy is on a marginal cost basis, which we economists know is the only thing that really matters, the, the marginal cost of wind and solar and, and almost all green energy is nil. And it's very hard for even a falling price of fossil fuels to get to nil. It is so cheap to generate wind and solar when you have built the expensive plant. In the short term, greening is a very energy intensive effort. When you build a windmill, you put all your labor and all your materials and all the mining that went into it up front. And the same with solar. And the same with battery storage. It's almost weird how incredibly intensive in terms of energy and resources it is up front. Then when it's built, it runs itself at almost zero cost. So that pulse, if you will, to build at a massive increased rate, wind, solar and storage, creates an enormous, strange increment in demand for energy, which cannot be met yet, of course, by green energy. So it causes the demand for fossil fuels to go up. Economists have an ability to build models and get off into abstractions and assumptions so profound that after a while they need to pinch themselves and remind them, remind themselves where they live in the real world. I think Brexit was uh, one of the worst self-inflicted wounds in modern times that any economy could pull so that any, anyone who's building, any Toyota building a plant uh, in Europe, who might have built it in Scotland or the north of England will, of course, now be paid in a way to build it in Europe. And that isn't immediate. Some of it is pretty quick, but it goes on and on for decades. That has just lowered the growth rate of the UK. And then, of course, a lot of industrious Europeans who were settling happily in England and the UK, because of the combination of Brexit and COVID, went home and stayed home. And that's taken a lot of blood out of the system. And they were some of the most uh, industrious people that, that were there. Yes, they try very hard in terms of venture capital to gear up. And they will have, by the look of it, some success. But um, it's a bit like the tail trying to wag the dog. Uh, much better than nothing. But um, the truthful answer is, I don't know why they're quite so good. I think whatever success we're going to have will be on new technology. And I am a great fan of American venture capital. It is, I think, the last best American exceptionalism. We're not very exceptional at many things. We're exceptionally bad at plenty of things in America. But the VC, we have the best and the biggest, always have and will for a considerable amount of time.